Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Conversations with the Fed, the Complex Economics of Growing Old. I'm Carmiana Matson, Assistant Vice President of Regional Outreach and Public Programs at the Minneapolis Fed. And I'm joined today by Maria Christina Denardi, the Thomas Sargent Professor of Economics at the University of Minnesota, and a consultant to the Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute at the Minneapolis Fed. I'm also joined by the Minneapolis Fed's senior economics writer, Jeff Horwich, who will be moderating today's discussion. Before I turn it over to them, a few housekeeping items. I have included a link to Maria Christina's research in the chat box on Zoom. So if you have questions to pose for her during her presentation about her research, please type those in the chat box and Jeff will be looking out for those. Maria Christina's slides and a copy of this video link will be emailed to all registered attendees sometime late next week, so you'll be able to follow up with additional information there. And we'd love to get your feedback at the end of this presentation, so please take a moment to fill out the brief survey that will pop up in your Zoom window when you exit the webinar. And finally, we hope you'll join us for our next virtual event, which will be a briefing on current economic conditions in Minnesota's hospitality and tourism sector. That will be held on September 23rd at 9 a.m. Central, and we'll communicate with you via email when registration is available for that event. And with that, I'll turn it over to Jeff. Thank you so much, Carmi, and good morning, everybody. I had a fascinating time getting to know Maria Cristina's work for a recent article here at the Minneapolis Fed. I'm excited to be able to share it today with a whole lot more people, and we do have many folks uh, registered and joining us today, which is wonderful. So without uh, further ado, welcome, Maria Cristina, and thank you so much for joining us. I'm very grateful for this event, and I would like to thank the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and the Opportunity and the Inclusive Growth Institute for organizing it and in particular, Jeff and Carmi for uh, uh, facilitating and uh, conducting this conversation with me. So thank you very much. I prepared um, a few slides before we turn to the even more interactive kind of conversation. And um, I would like to talk about the complex economics of growing old. So you might wonder, why should we study the retirement period? And I think there are at least two important reasons for that. The first one is that uh, retirement is an important and long stage of life. And for some groups, it has been um, becoming even longer in recent times. And you know, recently with COVID, maybe with the, for some other groups, it has become shorter, but it's certainly a, an important stage of life. So not only it is important per se, but um, what happens during retirement affects important decisions even before retirement. Right? People uh, forward looking and take into account what will happen in the retirement period earlier on. For instance, when they think, how long should I work? And when should I retire, meaning stopping working and uh, claiming social security benefits? And how much should I save? Okay, So it's important for two reasons to study retirement per se. It's a long period, and as we will discuss, it's a very interesting period, but it also affects decisions before that. So for these reasons, I think it's really important to understand what is going on during retirement. And we have a lot of points that we want to touch on today. We'll try to keep an eye on the chat for other questions that roll in. Uh, but let's move forward. Just talk about um, the key considerations of this retirement period, the key, the key risks, for example, that economists and uh, anybody looking at that period of life uh, needs to keep in mind. Okay, that sounds great. Um, so I will focus my remarks on the economic aspects of retirement, but there are also important psychological and emotional aspects that maybe we can briefly touch on later. Um, so let's talk about uh, the key points of uh, the economics of retirement, what is going on. First of all, retirement is a period of big risks. There is a lot of uncertainty, and I will tell you more in a, in a second. And these risks are very different across people. So there is a lot of inequality in the extent to which these risks uh, play out. So let's talk more about what these big risks are. So the first important risk is two sides of the same coin. It's mortality and longevity risk. So by mortality, we mean that 
we are not exactly sure how long you are going to live and people might end up dying young and leaving a lot of resources behind that they have saved to finance their retirement. The other side of the same coin is that the opposite might happen. You were expecting to have a certain life expectancy, but there is risk and unexpectedly you end up living much longer. You exhaust your resources, you exhaust all of your um, saved assets and you are left with social security, pension income flows, but that's a much lower standard of living than you were anticipating. So you know, on the mortality side, you leave a lot of resources behind that you don't get to consume them. And on the longevity side, instead you end up living a long time and you end up having a low standard of living lower than you were hoping. Another important risk is nursing home risks. Oftentimes, and I will give you some numbers in a bit, uh, people have adverse health events. Uh, we usually call them impairments of activities of daily living. For instance, um, ability of getting in and out of bed, ability to feed oneself, ability to walk a block. So when this happens, that people experiences, experience uh, impediments in activity of daily livings, they often need to be in a specialized facility uh, or a nursing home and that's what we mean by nursing home risk. And we call it risk um, because it's a very expensive proposition. Um, there is a lot of variation in nursing home costs across states, across, you know, even within state. But uh, $100,000 a year is a, a number that can help anchor um, a typical cost. And so, you know, if you are end, up, end up in a nursing home for a long time, a year or longer, this becomes a very expensive financial risk that someone has to pay for. Another form of risk is that not only people who become in bad health have the pain of being in bad health, but um, health itself can not only affect uh, resources, but can affect the needs of consumption and medical expenses that people face. For instance, you are in bad health, uh, you no longer derive the same enjoyment from going out to restaurants or uh, hiking because you cannot eat that much or you cannot walk that much. On the other hand, you might need much more medical goods and services. So this is a, another effect of um, health and that's an important aspect of retirement. In addition, this is not about risks, but it's an important consideration. What we observe is that many people leave resources after they die. And they also say that they do want to leave resources after they die. So we conclude that many people care about living bequests. So they want to share some of their assets with other people after they die. So that's another consideration about the retirement period. The third consideration and last one that I want to make on this slide is that um, we have risks. And we also have some form of social insurance that help insure against those risks. Okay, so some of these programs like uh, Medicare and so all these social security benefits are specifically designed for older people. Others programs such as Medicaid that helps with medical expenses for people who um, turn out to have lower resources or supplemental social insurance, they're not specifically designed for the older age, but they turn out to be very helpful when older people find themselves into um, needy situations. <laughs> Now, we're going to come back to many of these before the hour is up in more detail, and uh, there are fascinating questions associated with each of them. We uh, are not going to throw a lot of numbers at people today, but I think it, it would be really valuable to have you give us a sense of the, the size of the risks, maybe how they apply to different people. So let's talk about um, mortality, longevity risk first. Show us how you as an economist look at those those numbers. Sure. Um, so let's talk about, uh, as, um, sorry, as um, Jeff said, about the mortality and longevity risk. And uh, one thing that I want to stress is going to be how in unequal they are across different groups. Um, one of the things that we have risks and they are very unequally distributed. Okay. So lots of numbers, don't fret. We will cover the key ones and I will um, explain what they mean. So take a 70 year old person and what we want to understand in this slide is how long do they expect to live on average after age 70, okay? So let's start from the bottle panel to set some ideas. Here, we are asking ourselves, 
um, let's look at single men who is age 70. How long do they expect to live on average? A single man age 70 on average expects to make it to age 79. Okay, so nine more years. And of course, there is uncertainty. This is an average life expectancy, but that's a typical target life expectancy. If we look at a married man, we see that a married person expects to live to age 81.5 on average. So let's say age 82. So that's a three years gap. Uh, a, three, a three year gap in uh, um, life expectancy between a single and a married man. Okay, So three years of additional consumption and resources is not a small amount in terms of financing this difference. These are, uh, I saw a question in chat, <laughs> so since it's a quick question, this um, is a data set that refers to all of the United States and it's a representative, a nationally representative um, uh, data set. So let's compare with women. So in this bottom part of the table, we are going to compare inequality in life expectancy by gender and by marital status, right? So far we have seen a three year gap for um, single and married men. And let's look at the difference by gender. Let me clean this up. Uh, let's look at the difference by gender. So we have the single man expecting to make it to 79 and the single woman expecting to make it to almost age 84. So we see a large heterogeneity in life expectancy. We have five more years between single men and single women, okay? So married women, just like me, me, um, married men, expect to live longer on average. So that's a, a, an important uh, part of heterogeneity, but I want to tell you a little more, okay? So, so far, we have looked at men and women by marital status, okay? Now I want to break it down a little further to give you a sense of how dispersed is this uh, um, life expectancy already at age 70, so a fairly advanced age. So in, in the columns, we do it by health. So this one is bad health and good health for men and for women. And along the rows here, I look at another very important observable, which is income, okay? So let's pick some numbers to give you an idea of this gap. So let's pick a single man at the bottom 10% of income, okay? So this 70 year old man expect to make it to age 77, okay? So that's the lowest life expectancy that we have seen so far. We know that people with lower incomes uh, expect to live uh, for a shorter amount of time. And we see that this is true, even conditional on the same health status. Just to give you an idea, um, a single man at the bottom 10 percentile of retirement income makes about $8,000 in um, uh, income flows from social security and pensions every year. Someone at the top 10 makes about 24 k okay, so three times as much. Uh, just to, I just would like to show you another extreme. So let's pick a woman who is in good health, so she's here, and she is at the top 10% and she's married, okay? So she expects to make it to a, a whopping age 87 on average. So that's last 17 years of life. And the lower number that we have here is plus only seven years, right? Sorry for the terrible writing. Um, so, uh, so there is a full 10 year gap just along these observables in life expectancy. Mm. Well, and there's so much that jumps out once you once you break it down. I think it's so important to show uh, the uh, effects and how they vary depending on um, people's gender and health and all that. And let's let's do something similar for the next risk that you mentioned, uh, nursing home risk. Sure. Um, as we said, a nursing home is very expensive. So let's see. Uh, let's take a 70 year old person in our data set. Um, and let's look at what is the probability that they enter a nursing home before they die over their remaining years of life as of age 70. So the structure of the table is similar. So for instance, let's start from the bottom again. A single man at age 70 expects to ha has a probability of entering a nursing home of 26%, right? That's a really large number. That's a 26% probability that you will end up in a nursing home and the typical nursing home stay is around two years, right? So that's a, non, uh, non, uh, that's a large financial um, cost. 
if we look at a married man, here we see the first interesting difference. Uh, a married man compared to a single man has a much lower 19, let's say 20% compared to 26, a much lower risk of entering a nursing home. Some of these might come from the fact that they are uh, healthier, they have a better lifestyle, but some of it might come from the fact that partners, spouses can help each other. And, you know, if one of them maybe has some physical impairment and the other one has starts having some um, mental impairments, they can balance each other out, okay? But this is a robust fact that we see that both for men and for women, um, being married tends to reduce the chance of entering a nursing home. The other important fact that we see from these um, numbers is that women have so let's compare, for instance, a single man with a single woman. The single man has a 26% probability of entering a nursing home as of age 70, while the single woman has a 37% probability of entering a nursing home. And this comes from the fact, mainly, that women have a longer life expectancy. And the longer you live, the more likely you are to experience a long period of uh, sickness and enhanced uh, needs toward the end of your life, okay? So let's look at, uh, as we did before, let's look at a couple of uh, uh, extremes also. Let's pick a man who is in bad health and is at the bottom 10 percentile of income. He has a probability of 24% of entering a nursing home. If we want to look at a really uh, a much larger number, we can look at a woman in good health. Right? This might sound counterintuitive, that a person in good health has a higher probability of entering a nursing home. The, the kick, the, the reason is that a person in good health is going to live longer. And the longer you live, as I mentioned earlier, the more likely you are to spend a long time in a nursing home. So that's why we see that women have a higher probability of entering a nursing home. Let's go back to this risk that you label uh, life enjoyment risk, basically that you will, will not be able to enjoy your spending later in life the way that maybe you thought you were going to. And that just really sets the mind working once you start thinking about those effects. Tell us more. Sure. Um, so let's think a bit uh, about more broadly, right? This is, a, again, this is a, a talk that is quite narrowly focused on economics, and there are many important uh, aspects that we are not focusing on. Uh, but thinking about what health does during retirement, um, we need to think about uh, the fact that spending and enjoying life during retirement depends clearly, you know, to some extent, it's a function of how much money you have. It's not the only determinant, but it's an important determinant, but also how much enjoyment we get from spending the money we have, right? And this is where health plays an important role because what we find in our research that uh, as health declines, we get less bang for the buck. What this means is that we get less enjoyment from consuming regular goods and services. Um, for instance, um, a Think about a life event that is equivalent to not being able to walk a few blocks or um, not uh, being able to climb one flight of stairs, okay? So what we observe is that when this happens, the consumption declines by 2% on average and by 6% for poorer people, okay? So this, and what we also find is that this does not come from the fact that they have less resources, but comes from really from the fact that they don't get as much enjoyment from spending money, for instance, going to a nice restaurant or going to hike for in a fancy location. Uh, on the other hand, these same medical events lead to an increase in medical spending. Um, the same medical events I described of the difficulty of walking several blocks or uh, the difficulty of uh, climbing one flight of stairs, increase medical spending that people pay out of pocket by 7% for uh, on average and by 21% for people at the bottom in uh, wealth quintile. So this is another important uh, effect of health that we observe during the retirement period. And let's just talk for a moment about the data here, because I think you are able to look in a really granular way at how a person's lifestyle changes uh, as their health declines. Where does that where does that data come from and what kind of things are you able to understand about uh, those life changes? Yes. 
So this is a, a data set that is called the Health and Retirement Study that is conducted by the University of Michigan. And it's an amazing uh, data set. It's a survey that they administer to people and they try to understand both their um, economic situation, but there is also a lot of detail on health. For instance, they ask detailed questions of medical diagnosis, but impairments, there, are, there is a ton of questions and we can really measure health as well as we can hope for. And it also has detailed data on consumption. There is a consumption module, and so we can see um, how much people spend what kind in uh, consumption and medical spending and how that differs by people with different incomes and with different health shocks. So it's a really amazing data set. <laughs> I think we've reached the end of your slides, if I'm not mistaken. So we'll carry on with the conversation between you and me, keeping an eye on the chat here. If folks do have questions that they want to pitch our direction, we've just been through a couple of years with some change in life expectancy. Uh, life expectancy in the U.S. dropped by almost two years, we're told, in 2020, another six months in 2021. How how durable those changes are going to be depend, of course, upon um, this the future path of this pandemic and future pandemics, but it surely has changed our thinking about retirement and the way we experience our, our later years and the way we assess those risks, I would think. So what's your take on how the COVID-19 experience affects the risks and decisions that we're talking about here today? Yes, that's a really important question that is, uh, I'm sure, on uh, many people's minds. So, you know, just the direct effect uh, of uh, COVID, as you said, is that there has been a change in life expectancy. Uh, in many cases, uh, it went down. So the economic theory would tell us that everything is equal. When life expectancy decreases, you need to finance future consumption needs for fewer periods. So you should save less and consume more today because you don't have uh, such a long life expectancy as before. However, uh, you know, as we all know, COVID is much more than just uh, a change in life expectancy because it really has changed uh, a lot of uh, aspects in our uh, society. For instance, um, it has uh, increased uh, uncertainty a lot about the future. In the United States, many people keep working to some extent when they are older and rely on that income to finance their consumption to mm -hmm. the extent that, you know, with the risk of going to work or uh, inability of working, people could might not be able to rely on those income flows anymore, and therefore they will need to save more because they know that their working capacity will increase. In addition, um, we are facing an environment that is changing not only due to COVID, but for instance, we have rising inflation, and to the, it's unclear the extent to which purchasing power will keep uh, pace with this rising inflation. And people might also be worried that the economy might slow down. So all in all, what I'm thinking is that it's more likely that most people will cut their consumption and be frugal and cautious rather than reducing it, which is would be just the straight uh, implications from a shorter life expectancy. Mm -hmm. And there, but there's so much uncertainty involved. I mean, people are trying to read, you know, they're listening to the news and they're tr they're learning from the experiences of people who they know who've been affected by COVID. Everybody takes in all that uh, data, I guess, and uh, tries to make the best decisions in a very er uncertain situation. Absolutely. And most people in a time of uncertainty, they tend to save more because whatever happens, at least you have a little more of a cushion to land on. Mm -hmm. Now, you could write, uh, maybe you have, I haven't read them all, uh, entirely different papers on the experiences of couples and singles. It's a, an area that really jumps out when reading your work. The experiences are so different uh, in, in some ways. What are some of the crucial differences in how uh, people who enter their late life uh, as a couple experience that period differently than people who are single? Yes. Um, we observe that um, single people and single people with high income keep a lot of assets even when they're very old, in their 90s. And economic theory would tell us that they, we need to understand why they are saving so much. And we, have, we understand by now that they save because they want to leave bequests and because they um, want to finance their future medical spending that are very backloaded. Even older people face significant amount of medical spending coming, and part of it comes from nursing home risk. So. However, when we look at couples, it 
at first sight, it appears even more of a puzzle. Because when we look at couples, they tend to enter retirement with more resources and they tend to keep resources even later in life. Oftentimes, they keep saving until there are two people in the couple. Okay? And, and that's something that at first was puzzling to us, but then we thought more, uh, we measured more what happens um, when the first spouse dies in a couple. And there, you know, we were talking about risks. That's another enormous risk from the standpoint of a retired household with two people. Basically, um, upon death of the first spouse, income drops. And it, it, the reason that it drops is that uh, the two spouses often have different uh, labor supply histories. The secondary earner, typically the wife in these older courts, has a much lower um, social security entitlement. So she, she relies on the husband's one. And given the social security rules and their history of uh, labor, uh, um, labor supply, income drops typically drops by 30% when the wife dies first and by 40% when the husband dies first. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's the fir first big thing that happens. Second, when the first spouse dies, you lose what economists call economies of scale. So you have two people in the same house, right? It's true that two people spend more than one, but they typically don't need twice as much resources as one because they can share the refrigerator, they can share. Uh, so um, this loss of economies of scale means that after the loss of one spouse, the surviving spouse consumes the same house, but there is only one person. And in fact, oftentimes, 20% um, of couples, when the spouse dies first, they sell the house. And this is in days, it, it's great that they can sell the house, but we all know that there are liquidation costs of buying and selling. So that's another cost that happens. Another important risk when the first one dies is that medical expenses jump, right? We probably all have experiences with people being sick and before death, and we know that there are often hospitalizations, treatments, and so on. So the medical expenses uh, jump, the ones that people pay, the couples pay out of pocket, right? So those that they have to finance themselves, they jump $30,000 more for a couple for which there is a death compared to couples where there isn't a death. So income drops, medical expenses jump, you find yourself in a bigger house and just one person. And um, in addition, many couples, when the first uh, partner dies, choose to distribute some bequests to children and other relatives. This also reduces the resources of the surviving spouse. So once you understand all of these complex dynamics, you know, in addition to the emotional loss of losing your spouse, there are a lot of these economic forces going on, then you understand why couples might want to save as long as there are two of them, because there is a big shock that is potentially coming. And as I recall, it doesn't happen all at once. There, you were able to look in hindsight and see that that effect for couples begins um, in some cases, what, four, kind of four years in advance of the death of the spouse and then continues for a couple of years after. Yes, to some extent, uh, couples, uh, you know, um, I feel bad when I say that is uncertain because, you know, we talk about it in clinical economic terms, uh, but that is uncertain. But to some extent, as time gets closer, it is anticipated, right? So this is not necessarily a sharp drop. Our data are every two years. This is the nature of the data set. So that's not necessarily something that it, the bulk of it happens the two years before and the two years after death. But to some extent, there is a bit of anticipation and we see something even in the four years, four years before death and four years after. We have a couple of uh, questions in the chat just to clarify how you uh, approach the data when someone, when you have a transition from a couple to a single. So when a spouse passes away. Um, so how do you determine who are considered couples and who are considered singles uh, in the data when you work with it? Uh, yes. So we look at the data several ways because we want to have a complete picture, um, but um, we, the, the, the fact that I described, um, when I described the stylized fact about savings for singles and saving for couples, refer to people who start retirement as single, uh, 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 single, so they might have been married before, but they either were divorced or lost their spouse. 
So they aimed, it also includes the people who become singles afterward. Okay, so when I was mentioning uh, singles keeping, a, but you know, the savings pattern are not very different when you look at people who were initially singles as of age 70 and those who become singles after. They, they behave very similarly. When I was talking about um, couples, the stylized uh, description that I was um, using refers to intact couples. Basically couples uh, until both are alive and then we drop them from the sample. If we look at couples and we keep them in and we look at their savings when the first one dies, we do observe much less accumulation, which is consistent with the wealth disappearing when the first one dies. So I hope I answered the question. Well, at the very least, it is really important to keep an eye on those dynamics and to slice and dice things a few different ways um, to make sure that you uh, get a, a glimpse of how important those different effects in those moments are. Um, Let's talk about uh, bequests and their their role in uh, savings decisions and also how they are related to the uncertain medical expenses that uh, that people are trying to plan for as best they can. Yes. Um, so we find uh, bequests to be very important and the uh, interaction between bequests and um, medical risk being very interesting. So there are several things I can tell you here. Um, so let's start with one and let's see if you have appetite for more. <laughs> later. Um, so essentially, what the, one way that we can think about bequests is that if people derive some happiness from leaving assets to others after they die, this reduces the cost of keeping assets when they are alive. So let me explain. Insurance markets against these risks are not well developed. Ideally, we would like a wonderful um, insurance um, product that insures you against nursing home risk and that pays out as you need it related to your health and has no cap, right? Mm -hmm. Because the risk, the difficult risk is really the one of spending a long time in a nursing home and having to pay a lot, okay? In practice, these financial products are not sold, right? We could have a discussion why, they, maybe this is a bit um, outside the scope of what we want to do, do today, but basically what people are left with is saving, right? If you save, this means that you keep your house, you keep your checking account, you keep your stocks and bonds, but if you die early and you don't care about leaving bequests, that money is wasted from your standpoint. Right? And so we can say that under a certain aspect, the rate of return of those assets is very low when people die if they don't care about leaving bequests. Okay? So instead, if people care about leaving bequests, all of a sudden you have a return from leaving those assets. Right. So essentially what bequests do in this environment where we don't have great um, um, instruments or insurance products, Bequest reduce the cost of saving for your medical expenses because if you die prematurely, you derive some happiness to uh, from your children receiving them. So that's like a higher rate of return from the standpoint of the individual. So what we find is that the interaction of the bequest motive and medical expenses is super important and it's really a first um, rate driver of savings because you have this medical expense risk and you need to save because you need to keep some resources for when you're old and frail. And the, the fact that bequest motives reduce the cost of holding these assets, because when you die, you derive some happiness from them, really um, is an important reason why people keep holding assets in old age. I, th I think there's a lot to uh, to learn there policy-wise about why the long-term care insurance market has struggled both to be attractive to consumers and also companies to find it appealing to sell. And the, uh, the idea that self-insuring means that you will, if you don't use it all, you will have money left for your heirs is seems to be a really powerful uh, effect and way of thinking about that challenge. There's a lot else going on as well. But uh, that was something that I found really kind of a light bulb went off reading about that. We got a couple of questions um, about how things might look 
different in other countries? And there are a bazillion ways you could probably answer this, I suppose, but looking back to some of those risks that we talked about earlier and, and some of these key themes, uh, you're, look, you're working with United States data, but uh, how would things vary in countries if someone asked with uh, you know, a higher level of uh, social insurance, for example? That's a, a super interesting question because there is a lot of variation across countries. So just to formalize ideas, the biggest component of medical expense risk in old age is a nursing home stay. Nursing home costs make for 70% of total medical costs of older people, okay? So let's focus on the nursing home risk because that's the bulk of it and it it's, um, uh, makes for a clearer discussion. Compared to um, many other countries, let's think about Europe. Um, for instance, it's a, an environment that I'm quite familiar with being Italian. There is an interesting distinction um, between Northern Europe and Southern Europe and the US, okay? So in Northern Europe, Unlike the US, well, we can talk about more the, the US more in detail as well. I think that's important. In Northern Europe, in many countries, in Sweden, in Denmark, in the Netherlands, the government pays for most nursing home costs. Okay. And, you know, because this is about 70% of the, and also pays for all of the other medical costs. So basically, basically people have very little medical risk. Right? Yes. And that really decreases their necessities to save. Essentially, they save to live the quest. Okay. Um, in Southern Europe, governments don't pay for this, but there is a, a very large family support. There is a lot of co-living or people don't move a lot and they are at most two miles from their other family members. So there is a lot of um, help across generations and uh, or across even people of the same generation who are healthier. Um, in the United States, um, the environment is yet a bit different because Medicare doesn't cover, cover nursing home up to a certain number of days and they are meant to be um, temporary nursing home. For instance, after you have surgery, you need to recover and that's what Medicare covers it. But for longer nursing home stays, we have Medicaid, which only kicks in when people's assets uh, and income are low with respect to the costs, right? So the reality of the United States is that your nursing home needs are only covered when you become poor by Medicaid, right? And this, an interesting consideration is that these nursing home costs are so large for most people that Medicaid ends up currently paying for 70% of nursing home nights. Okay, which, you know, if you think about it, is a huge amount. So there is a little, a lot of interesting differences. For instance, in the United States, higher income people face this risk of ending up in depleting their assets and eventually ending up in a Medicaid nursing home. But before that, they have to pay out of pocket compared to the northern countries where this risk doesn't exist by and large. In Southern Europe, the government doesn't pay much, but there is a lot of burden on families because, you know, people who you, know, you save on taxes, right? Because you don't need to pay for this expensive nursing home. But on the other hand, there is a very large burden on children or other people because we, you know, some of us know firsthand, other can uh, understand that it's, um, it, it's a lot of work to take care of an elderly person with needs. And so I think it's super interesting to think more across countries and to think about why we evolved a certain way and what could be a, an ideal scheme of insurance considering the realities that are different across countries. And this reminded me of something that uh, you and I talked about. And you'll have, you might have to remind me of this is your research or research you were referring me to, but about how uh, changes in Medicaid costs appear to affect the decisions of not just low income um, households, but households with greater income because of that, that high, higher likelihood than some of us might think, perhaps, that, uh, that we will be in that situation down the road. Medicaid matters to more people than you might think it matters to initially and when it comes to nursing homes. Yes, absolutely. That's a very important point. And it especially holds for single people. 
right? Because we have seen that single people have a higher risk of entering a nursing home, while as long as you're in a couple, the spouse can to some extent help or at least postpone the cost. So um, let's go back to this idea of self-insurance, okay? So self-insurance means you save and you don't have a specific insurance product that only pays off when you need it, right? Let's say your checking account gives you X percent every year, no matter whether you're healthy or sick, and it's still there after you die. Okay, so that that's so it, it's great, but on some hand, if you're really worried about needing money when you're sick, you would like an asset that pays more when you're sick, right? Self-insurance means you deal with the risks as best as you can by saving with a, an asset that provides a rate of return that is independent of your health or your needs. Okay. Um, so in this situation, what is really difficult to ensure using your savings? What is really difficult to ensure is what we call tail risk or disaster risk, right? Um, Macroeconomists talk about disaster risk as stock market crashes and these kind of things, but there is also a micro disaster risk at the household level. So what is uh, in retirement this disaster risk? It's living a long time, right? and having a really long nursing home stay, right? So you're compounding two risks, right? First, you live a long time. And second, you, at the end of your life, in your twilight years, you have all of these nursing home stays that you need to finance. So this is an event that happens with low probability, but when it happens, it's really catastrophic, right? These kind of events are exactly the events over which self-insurance, your stocks and your bonds are not particularly effective because you know, especially if your request motive is not super strong, you either save a lot for the tail event, for the catastrophe, and then you leave a lot of assets more than you would like, or you don't save enough and you find yourself with the low standard of living when the catastrophe, if the catastrophe realizes. Mm -hmm. Because of this, because single people uh, have a really hard time insurance against this tail risk, Medicaid is really valuable, right? Put yourself in the shoes of a highly educated professional who had a good income over their lives. They can keep a good cushion in retirement, but they don't know if they will make it to age 98 and spend five years in a nursing home from 92 to 98, or they will die at 84, right? So this is the key idea about why Medicaid can be so valuable even for single wealthier people. Because even if you start with a good cushion of assets, either that cushion is too large for when you don't need it, or it's too small for when you need it, and Medicaid provides you a minimum, you know that you will be in a Medicaid nursing home, you will not be under a bridge, okay? And, you know, I don't make, mean, mean to make any statement on Medicaid nursing home. I mean that it's a very valuable option, even for any part you know, the number I mentioned before, Medicaid paying for 70% of nursing home nights tells you eventually how many people end up on Medicaid. It's a good moment to um, just hark back to that kind of initially counterintuitive fact that you found, which is that the healthier you are, say at age 70, the more likely you are to enter a nursing home and uh, how that factors into people's uh, decision-making, whether that particular statistic, which is borne out in the data, is something that people perceive and plan for. Um, I don't know, your guess is as good as mine, but it's something worth learning about and studying and remembering. Yeah, there is an image that one of my co-authors always uses and says, the co-author in question is a man, and says, you know, I'm going to die on the golf course at age 70 while I'm swinging the <laughs> my tennis. Nine iron. <laughs> yeah, my, yeah. Uh, my, my iron. And my wife is going to die at 98 after she spent seven years in a nursing home. Right? So, you know, um, there is a difference for men and women, and there, uh, and there is also a difference in how long. So the, about the fact that healthy people will tend to live longer, and the longer you live, the more likely you ha are to be in a nursing home and to need help. So, yeah, it's a, it's a counterintuitive at first sight, but once you think about it, it makes sense. 
So we got a number of interesting questions in the chat, and we'll try to attend to some of these. Some of these might fall outside the range of your immediate research, and if so, you're welcome to demure <laughs> or refer us elsewhere. Um, but here's here's an intriguing one. Wondering if you have any somebody's wondering if you have any thoughts about senior cooperative living. I don't know how familiar you are with that, but this is uh, as this person describes it in their question: the practice of cooperative members managing budgets and expenditures for a large apartment building as people continue to age and age in place. Another way of Another way of pooling risk, um, perhaps. Does that resonate with uh, with your research? Um, I think studying. So I haven't studied the variety of um, assisted living co-ops and so on. Uh, I think it's a fascinating topic to understand what kind of arrangements and how, depending on one's health, you can transition from one to the other. Right, because it's important to keep in mind that when you're relatively healthy, maybe you just need help with someone preparing you food and reminding you to take your medication. But then as people, if people de develop more needs, it becomes a 24 seven assistance, right? I mean, um, people literally need to help to be turned in bed and to be washed and so on and so forth. So, um, I think it's important to keep in mind that situation is dynamic and I'm not sure how a cooperative works, but at some point who is going to take care of the people who really need care 24 seven? That's something I just don't know. This being said, um, I think it's super interesting and important to see what kind of solutions the market has developed so far, right? Um, what kind of, because, you know, obviously the government plays an important role, but there is a strong reason why the market shouldn't also try to develop its own solution. And, you know, uh, it's great to have many minds trying to find solutions to a big problem. So I think this is a fascinating question, and I would like to learn more in the future what solutions have been developed and how well they are working, because we can learn a lot from those. Back to the realm of uh, consumption in old age, we have a bit of a economic, uh, an economic term here, an important one that you can define for us before we go on. Uh, someone asks, how does aging affect a person's marginal propensity to consume? Is there a big drop in expenditures other than health expenditures as people get older? And the way that you study these things is often as people get sicker or less, or less able. Um, what can you tell us about that? And it relates to a lot of what we've talked about so far, of course. Yes. So... I'm reflecting on how to best uh, answer the question. Um, consumption tends to drop on average a little bit in retirement. Um, and an important uh, reason why this consumption drops is that as we observe older people, more and more of them are in bad health and uh, enjoying, you know, when I mean consumption, I mean consumption on no medical goods and services, right? So typically most people, tend to enjoy less um, consumption as they age and become sicker, while the consumption basket tends to tilt, medical expenses rise, and uh, consumption of non-medical goods and services tend to lower. So, you know, it's an interesting consideration because we, we have seen over the past several decades that the relative price of medical goods and services is going up faster than the relative price of the consumption basket. So maybe that's something else that we haven't mentioned, but that there is a interesting work that is trying to understand why the price of medical goods and services is going up so fast. This is not my research, but I think it's fascinating. And going back to the uh, angle across country, what the United States is the country that spends the most in medical goods and services in total, paid by the government, uh, uh, paid by private insurance and paid by people. So there is interesting work that is trying to figure out, is it because we provide better care or is it because the prices for medical care and services that we pay in the US are higher, right? And, mm -hmm. and uh, the answer is both, but it also finds that we, uh, the average price, if you construct a typical basket of medical goods and services that we pay in the United States is 25% higher than in comparable European countries. So it's interesting to think about these consumption baskets, how consumption evolves over the life cycle, and what is the role of prices in affecting uh, these decisions. 
we have a couple of questions um, about how uh, COVID or people looking at what might be a shorter or more or less certain uh, lifespan will affect uh, desire to spend in old age. Um, and as one of them puts it here, uh, there's a there's often difficulty switching from a, being an accumulator all of your life, an accumulator of assets, um, to drawing down on those assets. Uh, what are your thoughts on helping retirees get comfortable spending or enjoying their years of hard work? And I know that you're not here to give advice, but um, do you uh, do you see what what dynamics do you see in terms of uh, you know increased spending uh, from people as you mentioned when your lifespan might be shorter? you will spend more today. Do you think that's going to happen? Yes, that's a very interesting question. And uh, there is an angle that we haven't mentioned in terms of COVID and, uh, and these decisions of how to spend and when to spend. Another thing that so we need to keep in mind that oftentimes there is the typical farm household with one or two people, but there is also a link with a younger or older household, right? Given the age group that we are talking about, we are thinking about a retired couple with middle-aged children or other middle-aged people they care about, but most often they have children. And an important thing that has happened in terms of COVID is that the earnings prospect of the younger generation have become more uncertain, right? Because we, with COVID, we have had a fraction of the population um, that temporarily didn't have a job, right? Because they couldn't go to work or maybe the labor market is changing because now we have learned to use Zoom. Some people are telecommuting, some people are not telecommuting. I feel that things are changing very fast. It's a really uncertain environment. Mm -hmm. So it might be that some couples or uh, single older people take into account the prospects of their children, even if they're middle-aged. Right. So there is this aspect of, you know, is someone really keeping assets because they don't know how to spend them? They are used to not spending them. Or are they also thinking, oh, well, you know, um, maybe my children will lose their jobs or my grandchildren will need to college costs are increasing and so on and so forth. So, you know, um, when you need to decide whether you want to encourage someone to spend or not, you need to keep in, sometimes people cannot formally articulate all of the reasons why they keep money, right? And maybe you're thinking they are not spending because they're used to not spend, but maybe they're worried about their children or their grandchildren or other relatives or events that maybe are not very likely, but they would be extremely painful for them if they were realized, okay? so. Mm -hmm. You know, I think it's important to make people aware of the risks and maybe have conversations so that there is, I find that talking with people really helps me think sometimes. And maybe that's why occasionally my answers are not ideal because I'm trying to develop the answer as I go. But I think that for many people, talking helps explain the decision problem and helps considering the various factors. So, you know, if you think that someone is not spending enough, it would be good to have a good conversation saying, why are you keeping all of this money? You know, nicely and uh, in a non-confrontational way. And maybe you will figure out that they are saving for something that you didn't realize they are saving. And that's valuable to them. Well, thank you for taking that on. One more question for you, and then we'll wrap up near the top of the hour. Uh, and it sounds like some other folks are wondering about this, and I certainly was when I first talked to you. These are such important topics. They're important for policy. They're important personally, but they're also very uncomfortable. We're talking about death and illness um, uh, and you know destitution and uh, you know at the end of life. Um, I wonder if how you uh, and other economists, you know. Um, deal with uh, grappling with such a difficult topic? Are you, do you think about it uh, as you are going through the numbers? Um, do you have to stop and pause sometimes and take a breath? How do you, uh, how do you approach working with um, uh, topics that can be sad? Um, yes, I've been working on this with a number of co-authors for many years now. And the way that we think about it is the following. First, this is super important. I think 
you know, there isn't much discussion in the public discourse. The older people face a ton of risk once you start thinking about it, right? From losing your spouse, loss of income, medical expenses, nursing home costs. So I think it's really important to think about this. Second, you know, as you mentioned, these um, health and loss of spouses come with very deep emotional hardship periods. And, you know, we all know how bad it is. I mean, hopefully many of us don't know, but being unhealthy um, comes with a variety of uh, deterioration in the quality of life. So the way that my co-authors and I think about it is that at least by thinking about the economic aspects, we can try to minimize the financial costs of sickness and old age so that we can try to cope. You know, if we plan far in advance, we can try to minimize the financial costs. And then when we are left with these difficult events, we have we can focus on focus on the emotional and health aspects rather than also focusing on the monetary aspects. So that's how we try to live with the fact that we every day we work on these um topics and every day we remind ourselves that these things happen. <laughs> Maria Castillo, thank you so much for committing uh, so much of your career to these important topics and for taking an hour to share with me and share with everyone out there um, just to scratch the surface of how we can understand them better. Jeff, I'm really grateful not only for the wonderful article that you wrote that kicked off this conversation and that was so successful and for the time that you took to discuss it with me. And I'm also super grateful to everyone in the audience who was here with us today and asked interesting and thought-provoking questions. Well, it's been a pleasure. If uh, if anyone out there joined late or you want to rewatch today's conversation, uh, the recording will be available shortly on the Minneapolis Fed's YouTube channel. We're also going to send a follow-up email to everybody who registered with links to the video and some additional materials. So thank you for joining us. I wish you all a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone. Goodbye.